Hi, everyone. Um, you know what I didn't realize? It was going to record this. It is recording. Oh, okay. It's automatically recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, an online presentation for the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. I just want to first start off by thanking the center for uh, hosting this presentation. And I want to thank Christine Bywater for helping us get coordinated. Um, and I get the, uh, my name is Laura Wentworth. I work for California Education Partners, where one of my roles is to help Stanford University Graduate School of Education and centers like Sue said partner with school districts um, in our local region. So I run the Stanford SFUSD partnership. Uh, so today I have the privilege of introducing you to our speaker. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off by um, telling you his name is Simon Scholden. Close, <laughs> close. <laughs> I, I've been mispronouncing it all day, but it's really a beautiful name. But um, he's a PhD candidate uh, from Mar Maralin. We'll, okay. we'll say so. We'll say so. <laughs> um, yeah, I practiced it well. Um, but from um, all the way from Sweden, I mean, he's out here visiting and meeting with lots of people at Stanford and locally, and then heading to AERA um, in Chicago. So you can catch him there too. He's presenting on a paper that um, uh, graduate school of education professor Amado Padilla and I ha actually have used in a, one of our classes on research practice partnerships. Uh, and it's a literature, a systematic literature review that I think anyone who's working in research practice partnerships, whatever your role, will find really useful in terms of the framework that evolved from these findings. I also met Simon actually virtually this, what was it, this spring or fall, oh. fall, fall, um, where we were both part of a collective of people um, that were working to build the field of collaborative education research. And I have another one of my our distinguished engagers, Kemi Oweli, and we have, oh, yeah, oh, here, Jane White is here, and others, and some of you that are probably on this call were involved. So without further ado, I just want to really welcome Simon to uh, the presentation, and I, I get to hand it off to you now. And you can, you can change, you know, correct all my mispronunciations. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, even though the pronunciation was a little mistake. <laughs> It was better when you practiced that. I know. Yeah, much better. Get all nervous. Yeah. So, as Laura said, my name is Simon Hurlum, and I work at Maladolin University. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, I will be presenting from, some, from a systematic literature review. And I have to, of course, mention that I had three co authors to this paper as well. I didn't do the work alone. They are my supervisors and esteemed colleagues, Janika Lindvall, Andrea Sriva, and Maria Larson. Without them, I couldn't do this kind of heavy work of doing a systematic literature review, which is one of two that I actually did in kind of the same project. But this one is also the one that I'm most happy with and that I think is most useful. So I'm happy to present that here. Kind of a quick overview of what I want to talk about. I think I will skip the about me part because that was so diligently done by Laura uh, and go to introduce the topic at hand, the objectives of the paper, and just briefly mention something about the methodology and before going into the results, the conclusion, which are the like, most in interesting parts, of course, and hopefully we can discuss something based on that. So we'll skip this, I think. And I think it's kind of custom to introduce and talk something about the, say something about the Swedish context as well. Uh, go coming to the US and presenting here, even though my systematic literature review has 90% of the articles from the US context, actually. So it's not really related to the paper that I'm presenting, but me being from Sweden, I think 
think it's kind of customary to give a little uh, info about our educational context. So first, uh, you'll see uh, some practical information. We have a preschool for ages one to five uh, with an 83% attendance. At age six, we got preschool grade, uh, which is compulsory from 2018, and then move on at age seven to compulsory education, which full qualifications, which means that 83.5% manages compulsory education and move on to uh, upper secondary education at age 16. And we have mostly national programs uh, and 5% of each preschool level. And then we move on to universities, which are all uh, state funded uh, in each of them. And you also have, if you haven't managed the grades to go to university, you have second chance education, which is basically an after school you can fix your grades a bit. Something about the like more kind of policy environment in the educational context, more general terms. We have a quite recently, uh, we have been run by the state for a long time, but now we have a decentralized system as well, which is run by municipalities to 85%. And we also have private actors. Uh, we talked about it, Jane and I, earlier. I mean, we could probably compare it to charter schools. Mm -hmm in a way, uh, which just constitute 15% of the actors in Sweden, <clears throat> which is provided by you know, taxpayers paying tax and then the state funds uh, students going there as well. Uh, they can you know, take profit from, from these schools, uh, the companies that run them, et cetera. And it's, high, and it's, a, it's a fierce debate in the Swedish educational context right now, whether these should be existing at all, or whether they should be allowed to take profit from taxpayers' money, and how it should be uh, constructed. We have a central state curriculum focusing on competences rather than content, which could be, and has been argued to be quite weak framing. You don't get that much guidance on how to do your work, which just could be positive or it could be negative. Uh, I leave that up to you. Uh, and that usually with a kind of weak framing, comes high levels of, of accountability and testing and, and control. And this kind of combination of high, high levels of accountability with weak framing uh, has been argued in research papers to produce quite insecure Swedish teachers uh, comparably to, for instance, neighboring countries such as Germany. Uh, we also have a school law uh, which states that educational practice should rest on a scientific foundation and established experience. So that's quite rigorously uh, framed in the, in the in kind of law sense of way. So it provides incentive, at least, to for research and practice to move closer together. And there are there is a lot of movement in Sweden right now to kind of find structures uh, to collaborate between universities and schools in order to improve schools and conduct research. And hence my interest in, in research practice partnerships, which is not a concept that it really exists in Sweden. We talk about collaboration, but not RPPs. Yeah. Is there an enforcement mechanism for school law? Often here in the States, people school, sue the state or the school district. Is that <clears throat> we have a kind of regulating agency, which is the school inspection or whatever they kind of do samples and go to schools and test them in both in relation to curriculum and, and, ball. Mm -hmm. and other quality measures as well but it's it's not that it's not a common practice to kind of soup schools or in, in, in relation to these laws can i just ask before how is the sound for the online people is it thumbs up Okay. Seems like it's working. All right. right. You can yeah. tell me and shout out if I need to speak louder. Yeah. Just FYI. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the more researchy stuff then. This framework, which I've you know adapted and focused a bit, is from Farrell et al. And those of you invested in and researching research practice partnerships probably know uh, this framework. 
So kind of to situate my article and frame it, this is not how I do it in the article and because they kind of came out at the same time, but kind of makes sense of what I actually attempt to do with this article. Uh, I want to contribute to the understanding and, and our understanding of research practice partnerships. And specifically, I try to kind of identify the boundary spanners and, and those working at the boundaries. How could they end up in different roles and try to contribute to the understanding of, of these smaller aspects of research, research practice partnerships. And, and I thought that was a kind of a lot of research was happening at the time and then there was an increased attention, which we will see also in relation to my data to doing research on these kind of structures. So there was a there was a place to kind of try to navigate and map the, the existing research. And that's why I decided to do this systematic literature review. So the objectives then. I've tried to challenge myself self also, I can say, both in terms of coming here, but in terms of doing a presentation nice. today, both that I'm not aware. So it might be too much and it might be, it's not going to be too little. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I had some objectives, of course. Uh, the main objective is to map how roles of researchers and practitioners are characterized in these kind of research articles. And the second objective that kind of follows is to discuss authority and engagement based on the findings that relate to objective one. All right, so something about the methodology. So this is, as Laura mentioned as well, this is a systematic literature review that entails a certain set of kind of principles and rigor uh, and ways of doing things. Uh, and I searched ERIC, SIGINFO, Scopus, and Web of Science in order to get kind of wide variety of, of different articles uh, as a base. And in my initial search, I got 1,220 articles uh, after removed the, removing the duplicates and stuff. And through inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, which is like formulated in my article, uh, I managed to get it down to 80 studies, uh, which is the kind of basis for my analysis. As I mentioned earlier, 90% of these studies are from the US context. So a lot is from, from here. And we can see that like concepts such as school university part partnerships and research practice partnerships, most of the research kind of comes from here. Some from Australia and some from the UK. And some might be in languages that doesn't kind of capture in my search. Uh, we can also see an increasing interest in these kinds of structures because 65% was from the last decade as well. And I had no kind of age limit to my search, but there was very few research articles that was very old. So most of the articles was from the last decade as well. A short mention of the analysis. Uh, I focused because most of the information on how the RPPs were structured and how they worked was in the background. That's kind of unconventional, you might say, for systematic literature review. Usually you look at the results of the articles mm -hmm. to kind of compile them into either mapping or kind of aggregating. Uh, but the information I wanted was mainly in the background of the article uh, in trying to find the main processes for school development, which was one thing I looked at, and also uh, task dis distribution to identify the different roles. So what kind of tasks were put on researchers and what was put on practitioners, et cetera. So to the results then, by looking at the main process for school development and distribution of tasks in RPPs, uh, we, me and my colleagues identified different kinds of partnerships. And I say different kinds of partnerships, mainly I just constructed categories based on the main process for school development. So what do they utilize the most to kind of achieve some kind of improvement or development in schools? And then I will call them a kind of partnership or a partnership type. And I also identify different role categories. But to start with these kind of different kinds of partnerships, uh, some partnerships mainly use inquiry for school development. They investigated practice through collect 
collecting, analyzing data, and trying to get more knowledge on a certain problem of practice. And if you've read some of the RPP literature, you might kind of see a similarity to Research Alliances, which is trained by Coburn et al. And how we say things. The same goes for the second category, which Coburn stated as uh, design research, in which you try to design a solution to a problem instead. So you, you work on designing something instead of just conducting an inquiry and gain more knowledge. You want to design or create something. So there's a difference on what you utilize to get at improvement in schools. And the third part is that you utilize the expertise and experience with different individu individuals. And so researchers and practitioners, they get together trying to utilize each other's expertise and experience in order to grow and, and achieve school development. So you see there are kind of different instigating factors for these kind of different uh, types of partnerships. And below all these, Oh, want us to just forward it? That's great. I can see. No, might be the batteries or something. I think this should be better. All right, and, and connected to all of these are different roles. We're going to have a, a lot of work. That's right. Just give me a cue. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> Since there are some like animations, That's right. so we'll figure it out. Not fancy. Yeah. All right. So. For each of these main processes for school development, we have different role categories for researchers and practitioners, and they're related since it's task distribution. So if tasks are distributed to practitioners, it's not gonna be distributed to researchers. So they're kind of connected. So that's why I couldn't kind of separate them into a set of practitioners positions and researcher positions. But I will talk less about them now and more about them. So we can uh, move on. So I'll do a few quotes, two of them, to kind of show you my analysis process and, and what I went through to, to achieve these results. So there you have a quote. During these briefings, researchers present key takeaways of the study, provide relevant handouts, uh, which is one page data analysis for each community school, and pose discussion questions known as considerations for practice to stimulate dialogue about how findings may be used for action. And here you can see that researchers do most of the inquiry work. They collect, they analyze and synthesize data, and then they kind of present the results as considerations for practice to, to practitioners. And practitioners are in charge of kind of translating these findings into something usable uh, and actionable in practice. And it's such, this is going to be a lot of boring process for you. And this is as such, we kind of categorized it as researchers, as expert inquirers, and practitioners as inquiry translators. And the next quote, then, also connected to the inquiry made process. During the meetings, researchers guided teachers thinking about CIs, critical incidents, by providing step by step methods to help them engage in qualitative data analysis of CI data. Here you can see that researchers and teachers are engaging together in a kind of analysis, even though they have different expertise and, and researchers help them with a the methodology, they engage together in, in the analysis of the data. Uh, and as such, we position them as, as co-inquirers in this sense. And in this way, when I kind of looked at all these quotes, read the backgrounds mostly of the text. I achieved this framework where we have the main process of school development and we have a different role categories for each section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll go through the, the three parts, kind of overarching. I won't be able to kind of present my whole results section, unfortunately, uh, but I will try to give you an overview. <laughs> All right, uh, so the inquiry partnerships, the most distinguishing factor was who was in charge of collecting, analyzing, and synthesizing data. Uh, so in the first one, as we saw, the researchers did most of that work. 
In the second one, they collaborated actively. And in the last one, researchers did mostly facilitating work in trying to teach or teachers to actually do inquiry work, teach them research methodology. And then teachers did most of the inquiry work themselves. So yeah, we can move on. Design partnerships, uh, they, both of these role categories started the same with an initial co-design of a solution, which was tested by practitioners and practitioners provided feedback to researchers. But then when researchers got this feedback, uh, it was a bit different. So in the first category, researchers uh, redesigned and provided the design back to researchers for, for another round of testing. And then this kind of iterated until they were happy with the design. In the second one, instead, researchers analyzed the feedback from teachers and kind of provided recommendations uh, to practice instead of doing the re redesign. And then practitioners was in charge of redesign based on these recommendations. And then this was iterated. So there's a slight kind of shift in authority between these role categories. And the last one then, and the main distinguishing factor here is who holds the knowledge to be shared? And in the first one, we see that researchers, uh, it's quite a traditional position where researchers kind of have lectures or, or disseminate research or scientific information to practitioners who uh, could gather in group discussion and translate uh, the, what, what researchers said into practice. In the second category, uh, we have researchers and practitioners as holding complementary knowledge. So in, in some instances, there was a engineering PhD students collaborating with a upper secondary school teacher, trying to figure out how they could work together on science teaching connected to engineering, for instance. Uh, and in the last part, we have researchers as facilitators and practitioners as the one holding the knowledge to be shared. And this is perhaps, if we return to Coburn's article, we could like, draw similarities to network improvement communities where practitioners are engaged in professional learning communities and they, they meet together to kind of accelerate learning from, from inquiry. But these are kind of, to some degree, there is always some inquiry as well. You know? So there, it's the main process for school development. So there could be instances of design, dissemination, and inquiry in all of these partnerships as well. Last slide and for uh, kind of concluding this is to provide some openings for discussion perhaps and, and trying to conclude my, my article. So how can RPPs adapt to local context and capabilities? So we have so many different contexts and so many different problems to work with. And the individuals vary as well in, in, in terms of capabilities in all these different areas. And then we, how you approach this framework of roles and, and main processes must, must, I argue, vary in terms of what kind of the conditions we're working with. And number two, when and to what degree is it appropriate for active collaboration and tasking? So as you can see in the inquiry part, the, the middle cal category of co-inquirers, there's it's quite a lot of active collaboration. So it's not just who does what, but to what degree do we meet and do something together as well? And while this is kind of identified as something that is very promising in terms of the practitioner use research findings in their in, in practice, it's also very resource intensive in a way, so that you need to find a, a balance between this as well, even though it's, it's construed as something we should strive for, uh, to what degree and to what extent and to what costs. And lastly, some of the RPP types and roles are arguably more democratic than others. You can skip to the next one. I think it's easier to discuss that. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah. Uh, someone had a question that was on Zoom. 
Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's a, a great presentation. Also, I apologize. I've got three small kids in the background, so you might hear them. Um, but I, I just wanted to clarify how you defined practitioner and whether that was uniquely teachers or whether that also included uh, like um, administrators or, or um, people who are involved in the day-to-day -day activities of schools but are not in the classroom. Yes, thank you. Great question. Uh, mostly teachers, but there were others as well. There were principals and school leaders, and I can't remember all the ID articles, but I think there might have been administrator and, and as such as well. So there's not only teachers, even though that is the kind of main focus of the article. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll continue. If there was no other question there. Yeah. No, great. All right, so the authority level, you can see I've kind of constructed the table to researchers having most authority at the top, kind of row one. And in the middle row, it's, it's quite equally divided in a way. And in the last one, practitioners kind of have more, I wouldn't say authority perhaps, but they have more responsibility for different tasks. Even though researchers as facilitators are in a quite authoritative position still. But practitioners are in charge of more and more tasks the further down the rows you go. And I also want to kind of briefly mention and get into because that's something I'm considering right now. We will need to find, what I think we need to find the kind of marginalized voices in this and depending on problem and context as well. What kind of voices do we need to kind of find all the relevant perspectives uh, in these different contexts, problems, competences? What do we need in order to, to find all the, the perspectives to challenge each other and, and to find the best way forward? Yeah. <laughs> Some references uh, of, that I used in the presentation and the last slide. Thank you. Is that your link to your That is linked to my profile on the university in which you can find like everything else. All right. Questions? Questions? Sure. Um, you know what? Would you go to this, the slide that has the, the questions frame. or the, like this? Mm -hmm. I think this is interesting. Mm -hmm. We start mm -hmm. discussion. Anyone want to kick it off? I just need to email address. Oh, okay. We'll go back to that. And then while, while you're doing that, let's go to Kemi's question. Kemi, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Kemi Ali Woolley. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate here in the grad school of education and really appreciate your work. It's been super instructive for, you know, students, Jane and myself as we learn and engage um, together with you in this. Field. Um, but one thing I was thinking as you were presenting these different modes of engagement is where, how do we get folks to surface what they want to do? And I'm um, giving agency to folks in terms of what role do they want? Mm. If that traditionally in research, we've had a, an imbalance in which research practice engagement has really um, left a lot of that decision-making to researchers. Mm. Uh, how do we balance, or how are you seeing this balance between <sighs> offering folks on the practice side an opportunity to choose? How would you like to engage? Would you like to learn a method about coding mm. data? Mm. Um, would you like to just digest it? Um, so that's sort of one of my uh, ways of thinking, but I think, or one of my questions that I pose, one of my concerns is that similar to young people, but all of us as learners, we always have a propensity to want to do one thing versus another, right? If you have a student who really doesn't like math and you're like, what do you want to do, math? Or maybe they didn't have great instruction in math such that they're engaged with it. So it's also like, how do we balance wanting to give folks agency, but also recognizing just because you didn't, you've never been exposed to research in this way doesn't mean you wouldn't enjoy it or mm. uh, so I just like to know how you think 
Thank you. Very interesting. And it's, I'm, I'm also a PhD candidate, right? So we're kind of in the same situation. And I'm following, I've been following a, a research practice partnerships. Well, you could, it's 99%, I think, very strict criteria for that. But um, I've also seen teachers and, and also principals kind of rejecting, rejecting one of some of the, most of my papers seem to uh, end up in some kind of positioning and role kind of discussion, because I think that's really interesting. And, and the negotiation of positions that kind of, the tensions that arise. But I've seen teachers kind of rejecting, as you, as you I, I sense that you give an expression of, so teachers and practitioners kind of rejecting that, well, I'm not, I don't know, ready, I'm not interested, I don't want this kind of authority or to do this, I want researchers to prescribe, I want researchers to do. And I think uh, for me and what I'm, what we're trying to do in, in, in future projects is to kind of try to build in some kind of progression yeah. of, of authority in, in the way that we work. To kind of do it lightly and in small steps to kind of see how their reaction is. And if some people are kind of rejecting all the steps of the way, um, we can't force them. But, but it's also hard when you say, well, how you're going to be an inquirer and do all of the analysis and synthesis mm -hmm. and, and presenting. So, I mean, working together, trying to shift responsibility little by little. I think that's a strategy that we're looking for in future projects. That makes sense. Good that sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, my name is Tom Chang. I'm a master's student in learning design technology. I was a secondary school teacher in Hong Kong, and I witnessed that there was uh, some kind of unwillingness or even resistance towards like teachers participating in research mm -hmm. for so many reasons. So my question is, how do we incentivize teachers to take part in research? In the classroom? Mm -hmm. It's also a very good question. I think it's very different. It's very different from different contexts. And that's, uh, I read a, a study that kind of compared the, the context of Sweden and Germany in this sense. And and even as, as you saw in the introduction, Swedish teachers are kind of insecure. But that also meant that they are very open to outside influence, which is not kind of a traditional teacher way of doing things. Right. So they want because German teachers were quite confident and they didn't want, no, we don't want researchers collaborating with us. And uh, we will we will we can discuss things and we consult things with our peers and we can read a book and we can do things kind of on our own. They're quite confident in that sense, but with the Swedish insecure teachers, uh, I'm not saying we should make all teachers insecure in order to cooperate with them, but uh, there is a difference in different countries and in different cultures, I think. And I think we need to approach it differently. And I have, I'm fully aware I haven't answered anything of your question, but um, uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I think the same, the same kind of thing that you need to, to some people, I think you need to prove, you need to work with those that are willing to work with you. And perhaps little by little, you can prove that this is an effective, and this is a good strategy to work with. That's also, we're applying for funding for a new project right now, which that was kind of hinting at with talking to you. And this is the same kind of strategy that we're, and evolving that if we can find a core set of people uh, that believe in this and we can work together with them and we can prove that well this this works perhaps we can little by little also this kind of stepwise win people over to this way of thinking or this way of working Are there are questions online i have one for mr chang all right go for it when were you in Hong Kong, pre or post SEZ Hong Kong? Yeah. Special economic zone. The British left before you, while you were there, or were they still there in Hong Kong? Um, in Hong I, was, I was born before the British passed over Hong Kong to China. So you were there doing both. How is it? It's more because you're asking a question about inspiring the teacher said. I'm just wondering how has the environment changed if that makes a big difference? Mm -hmm. I think 
more or less is still the same. Um, it's hard to get teachers to take part in research because um, teachers want to cover their ass. Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. they're taking part in a research project and it shows that they're not teaching effectively, yeah, that yeah. this makes them look bad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if they are given a choice whether to take mm -hmm. part in research or not, they choose not to. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason for them not to take part in research. Mm -hmm. That's a good chase. Yeah. Just one more question, if I may. Sure. To you. I'm wondering, we talked about charter schools. Mm -hmm. Is there any opportunity for educational choice within Sweden's education system? At what level? Uh, oh. Yes, you can choose freely and not at the lowest grade. You kind of in the in the proximity area you mm -hmm. can place in, in school but mm -hmm. otherwise in the lower most in the lower grades but otherwise you can choose really okay so parents can still do home schooling and whatnot and uh, no no they can't uh, uh from what's man, man compulsory school from like age six to 16 mm -hmm. ish mm -hmm. is compulsory and then they have to go to school but preschool they can skip if they want and homeschool, yeah. hmm. upper secondary school as well. Right, right, right. So most of it is still compulsory. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so you have this framework that stems from the literature you found, like these clusters of themes. Hmm. And when I read it, I was like, and it made sense when you just explained under the design category, like those group, those two buckets start with co-design mm. but I was kind of surprised in your framework that you had under inquiry co-inquirers mm. and then you didn't have co-designers mm. and I'm just wondering was that just the way you clustered that or was that actually showing up in the literature because there's so much written mm. about co-design and it made me wonder in co-design is it these two is it either you're this or that or is there top discussion in the literature of co-designing similar to the co-inquiry? I would say that both of these categories are within like kind of co-design okay. category. So they are. So that you're, you're saying they're both, they are both the researcher and practitioner here are co-designing. Yes. But while they're co-designing, they're playing these roles. Yeah. So they're, I didn't see that many articles. I can't remember perfectly now, but yeah. that's, did a kind of continuous co-design during the iterative mm -hmm. phase. Okay. So the initial co-design was always a, a co-design phase, uh -huh. but then perhaps it was, it was mostly a kind of back and forth between researchers and practitioners in the iterative phase later. And then they were playing these types of yeah, roles the, during the process. They didn't like, it didn't create a distinguishing factor to just have one co-design. I could have done that as well. Right. Have researchers and practitioners as co-designers. Uh -huh. uh, but instead to kind of distinguish them and create a, a difference uh -huh. in what I saw, I created these categories. And then my second question is on, you asked that question about adaptation to local context. Would you say you, you know, um, I've also heard a lot of talk around RPPs evolving and similar to what you said, there's like a, potentially there's a progression and you mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. between those. Did you find in the literature at all any capturing of that evolution? Like I started it over in the inquiry phase, but I also am doing the design phase because I I've heard a lot of RPPs as they mature, like Sometimes researchers feel like they don't have the expertise to answer the next question that the practitioner is asking or that they've co-developed co together and they need to bring in other expertise. But I'm just wondering, does that come up in the literature at all? It does. It does come up. And you could say that the design categories kind of captures that as well. Okay. That they're initially perhaps co-designers, but then they're, they they're more separate. They're, there's like something else. And... And it's, it is similar for other, I saw that in other partnerships as well, that they could, they can also move. Kind of, but I try to capture that as much as possible within the categories. Okay. 
So they kind of, and always in the inquiry partnerships, for instance, they collaborated on a initial question. So, so quite often there is a lot of work in the beginning that is highly kind of actively collaborative, but then they, they tend to distribute uh, mm -hmm. tasks more. So there is, a, there is a certain progression, but in that sense, I tried to cap the, capture the overarching uh, roles because that's kind of the distinguish in, in the latter uh, literature and, and articles I'm trying to write. That's the kind of distinguishing factor between positioning and, and roles. I tried to see roles more as well, this is the overarching role that they take in this uh, partnership, and then they negotiate positions uh, throughout the process as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is. It's a lot more fluid, probably, yeah. than what I than gave like us. Static yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. We need a graphic for that. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I'm interested in your questions two and three, and you mentioned boundary spanning at the beginning. Um, I'm interested now that you've read that literature. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can think of patterns you noticed in this review around when boundary spanning seemed to be happening more or collaboration or de democratic um, role taking seem to be more common or if you have if you might go somewhere with that next. i'm trying to do as i said i've been following a, a research practice partnerships and we talked about this as well on sustainable sustainable development in preschool that's mm -hmm. been going on for four years or something i've been collecting data video recorded observation of um, practitioners and researchers uh, meeting, a lot of school leaders meeting researchers. And I try to identify boundaries, right? So there is a lot of research on learning at the boundaries. I try to kind of characterize what are the boundaries that occur in these meetings uh, in terms of know discontinuities in, in, in negotiation or something where does it kind of friction where which holds learning potential emerge in these situations but i can't say that i have found an overarching pattern into where they kind of end up in the most collaborative uh, positions in that sense i'm trying to make sense of where they end up negotiating or, or ending up in these learning best environments for learning. And I'm trying to analyze this, these video recordings that I have. <laughs> so I kind of circumvented your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a McGummy. Um, I have a question, like you mentioned, like international context and yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, like, if research practice partnership is like a term used, like maybe the term, they use a different term. Um, and also, like, if you have an idea as to like why it's like so popular, what well, seems like there's more studies in the US. So I'm just wondering like, if you have ideas around like the reasons for that. Yeah, it barely <laughs> exists, <laughs> I would say, uh, outside the US. A lot of I've seen a lot of scholars taking the term off now in 2023. I was invited to do a dialogue paper on RPPs that's from UCL London as well. Uh, and uh, recently, pu recently published Sarah McKeon as well from the UK, published in the International Journal outside of the US. So there are some using the term and it's starting to spread a little, uh, but the, the actual RPP term itself is, and why I think it's because it was defined here. So it kind of, this is the originating place and it's, I think 2013 that Coburn did kind of define the, the term. So in that sense, it makes sense that it's kind of exploded in, in the US, but it's not, it hasn't really reached the outside. In Sweden, no, there's no, there's no mention of it. 
we don't talk partnerships at all. Generally, we talk about collaboration, uh, long-term collaboration in youth uh, research and practice. Other, other where the youth school university partnerships lie in, in Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, but it's hard to kind of do an international comparison because, you know, French or German, there's so many different languages, but but I think school university partnerships is a more internationally used term than, than research practice partnerships from my uh, reviews. Yeah. I was wondering, is any of the research connected to the European Commission or the European Union? No, I have no kind of connection to to the European Union in that sense. Uh, right, so my, I, up, you know, I was thinking about their guidelines yeah. compared to what your research is bringing mm -hmm. for, taking a look at the two together. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of kind of common uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. I can't say that that's something I've been considering too much. I've been mainly positioning myself in the Swedish kind of context and the regulating text that we have there mm -hmm. to kind of contribute to because there is a lot of interest in in collaboration between research and practice in Sweden but there are very few people who kind of look at how we can do that effectively. Well, I can assure you that President von der Leyen would like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I would be nice. <laughs> Any other questions online? Yeah. So, so I had a question. Yeah. Um, the um, so in terms of the studies you you used for this uh, for your study, what was because uh, I can imagine I don't know what kind of detail they had. Like you probably had to review articles that had a lot of detail about the whole partnership process, and because um, a lot of the articles don't have necessarily the detail to like understand their process to be able to kind of analyze it in this way. So what kind of, you must have had to go through a lot of articles that just have, didn't talk a lot about it or have, didn't have a lot of yes. detail. Yes. So, so what was yes. kind of your process there? So. Well, I had, so, so a systematic literature review, right? There is a, there's a strict kind of hierarchy of how you do things. So I had, Originally, originally, I had about 2,000 articles uh, to go through. And, but that was a kind of broad framework. I did a kind of visualization of different concepts used. Uh, and I identified research practice partnerships, school university partnerships, and university school partnerships as my key search words. And then I got to 1,220. And then I looked at titles and abstracts kind of identify which ones were relevant, which were actually research practice partnerships according to the definition. And then uh, when I, I can't remember the actual number, what kind of thing. That, that reduced it a lot. Actually. Yeah, I reduced that a lot. And then you go to kind of the full text. And, and when, when they're one of the key kind of components for me analyzing them was that I had enough information to be able to draw some conclusions from them. And that's why I kind of ended up at 80 and not 500, of which I am quite grateful <laughs> because that would have been, I would still be working with that. Better. And I would bet even the 80 had quite a variation as we go about yes. how much detail yes. they would have about yeah. the kind of the process where they yeah. are, because where they are in the process, like mm -hmm. how long they've been working together um, and, you know, have an influence all those kinds of factors. You probably it pro probably vary quite a bit. Very much, but the ones I had were still quite, you know, vivid in their descriptions of how the partnership worked. Otherwise, they they were yeah excluded. So, but yeah, the, there is a lot of variation, of course, in how you write things in different journals in different contexts and. and authors have a certain way of doing things. Was there any follow-up with any of the First. partnerships at all, like to get some any additional information? It was no. pure, pure, pure textual articles. Any other questions? 
Any last thoughts? I, I the last question I'll end with maybe if people want to want more is I love your last question around types. I would say typology in RPPs has been quite contentious. Mm -hmm. I think you saw the change from the white paper in 2013 mm -hmm. plan to grant to the 2021 where mm -hmm. they talk about dimensions of variation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I felt like that's probably why it's been useful to use your um, paper because it just starts to explore types mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering from a research lens, given that that's what you are, a researcher of mm -hmm. partnerships, it, like do you head more towards hey we should have a typology we should like name these things and define them or are the, those dimensions and variation like that's okay with you like that's going to be more useful from a researcher perspective i think the i think we always kind of seek a, a typology mm -hmm. and because it's very easy it's easy to kind of comprehend and to use, but as you said, I, I can't agree more. I think that it's it's more useful as a as a researcher to kind of have something more fluid, yeah, in a way uh, to look at different dimensions and, and look at it in different ways. So I think I would as as the question is exposed. <laughs> I would reject the kind of set uh, uh, type because it doesn't, it's so hard to capture uh, things with that kind of typology mm -hmm. to have a kind of final typology of things. Uh, sometimes they're useful, sometimes they can be very limiting. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. right, well, any last questions? Online group, this is your last chance. I need a lot of laughs. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to give uh, Simon a round of applause. Thank you for coming for coming all the way from Sweden just to talk to us. I know you did. Um, and we'll say bye to our online group, unless you have. You know, you want to unmute and say your last words. <laughs> nice to see you all. I see you. Um, and I just want to invite, uh, I think some of you.